Hi, welcome and welcome to our show. The nature here. Uh, our guest today is John Rakestraw, and today we're we're going to be talking uh, about bird feeding, right. different kinds of bird feeders and food, and we're going to take a look at hygiene and uh, doing feeding of birds responsibly. Right. We have. John, hummingbird feeders here. We have a hummingbird feeder. Let's talk hummingbirds. Um, we're very lucky in this area to have hummingbirds all year long. So um, feeding hummingbirds Look, is, is... Can I interrupt you? Sure. They don't go anywhere? They Where? don't. Why should they? Would you want to leave Portland? I don't. So they stay here all year. And um, if you put feeders out, you will see hummingbirds. All year? All year long. I mean, they come out in the winter. Yes. yes. We, have, we have one species that spends the winter here, the Anna's hummingbird is here all year long. We have another species or two that'll come through in the spring or fall, just passing through or sometimes nesting in the higher elevations, but um, the anis will stay here all year long. Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I have never seen a hummingbird feeder like this one. You can find hummingbird feeders in every different configuration. I like this style, I call it the saucer style, because it's the easiest to clean. And we talked about hygiene earlier. Yes. Um, with hummingbird feeders, there is a very, very fine line between feeding hummingbirds and poisoning hummingbirds. Oh my. Um, what you feed hummingbirds is a solution of white sugar and water. That's all it is. Mm. Um, so you um, put your solution in there. Um, imagine setting a can or a, a glass of Gatorade on your porch. Now, how long are you going to let that glass sit there and still drink it? Oh, my. Okay? In hot weather, you need to change it at least twice a week um, because um, it will either mold or it will ferment, both of which are toxic to the hummingbirds. And we did talk about this earlier. We don't, uh, the birds, you know, we want them to come to our yard so that we can enjoy watching them. Exactly. Uh, we don't want to be negatively influencing mm -hmm. Is this a rail for the birds? This is a perch for the birds to sit. Um, hummingbirds can hover when they feed, but if you have a perch on your feeder, they will sit there and they'll stay a lot longer, so you can enjoy them longer. In really cold weather, when they don't want to go too far from the feeder, sometimes they'll just camp out on the feeder if you have a perch there. Okay, this is the one I want. And you <laughs> know what? I don't think I've ever seen a hummingbird's feet. They're, they have very short legs, so you really don't see the feet very often. They're tucked up under the feathers when they're flying. When they do perch, you can see they've got the two toes front and back. Mm. But um, as I say, that, that type of feeder is the easiest to clean. Um, you can get beautiful blown glass feeders. You can get um, glass jars with plastic bases. They're all different configurations, but I like the saucer because, again, it's easiest to clean. Obviously, I'm uh, not that familiar with the life of hummingbirds. Is this a... a, a a bird that's across America? Or there are hummingbirds across North America. Most hummingbirds live in South America. Um, in the eastern half of the United States, there's just one species. If you go west of the Great Plains, you can get another 20 species or so. Here in the Portland area, you can expect two, maybe three. In eastern Oregon, there are another few that you can expect. Mm. Moving on to hummingbirds. This is a male Anna's hummingbird. Anna's hummingbirds are here all year long. Um, the adult males have a bubblegum pink head and throat. When the light hits it just right, you'll get various colors of green mixed in there too. This is a male Rufus hummingbird. Their throat is a little more orangey red and their body is more of a rusty brown color. We get Rufus hummingbirds in the summer months, migrating through in the spring and fall, but uh, they fly south for the winter. If you're very lucky, you might find a calliope hummingbird. That's the smallest hummingbird in North America. Male calliope hummingbirds are recognized by the purple streaks on their throat. Most calliope hummingbirds in Oregon are found on the east slope of the Cascades and in eastern Oregon, but we do get a few in Portland every year. This is an immature male rufous hummingbird. It has just a few speckles of color on the throat. But if you notice, the sides have that rusty color. We know it's a male because of the markings on the throat. And if there's any sort of rusty or buffy on the sides, we know it's a rufous hummingbird. This is an adult female Anna's hummingbird. Um, basically gray underneath, green above. The adult females will have a little bit of color on the throat. This is a female rufous hummingbird. A little bit of rusty on the sides and back, but it doesn't have the speckles of color on the throat. This is a male anise hummingbird, um, showing very unusual behavior, very sad behavior, unfortunately. Um, when you see a hummingbird with its tongue stuck out, um, that means the bird has a fungal infection. 
Um, the tongue swells up, the bird cannot feed, and it's almost always fatal. This is a good reminder to keep your hummingbird feeders as clean as possible. You want to change the nectar at least twice a week in the summertime, at least once a week in the winter. Keep the nectar fresh. Don't let any mold grow in the feeders. If you're concerned about hygiene and you're, you think you might not be diligent enough to keep your feeder clean, you can just plant lots of flowers in your garden. This is a young rufous hummingbird coming to some salvia. They love salvias, bee balm, foxgloves. So a good flower garden will get a lot of hummingbirds as well as the feeder will. Did you uh, bring any others? Or? I just brought that one. As I say, I always promote the saucer style because I would much rather you 
have an ugly feeder that's clean than a beautiful feeder that's got mold in it. Yes. And yes. some people like uh, so the aesthetics for their yard to have a beautiful glass feeder, and that's great if you're diligent. But my thought is, what could be more beautiful than a hummingbird? So get a feeder that's going to take care of the hummingbirds. John, this is fascinating. Now, uh, is it a garden shop that we'll find? You can find bird? feeders and seed in a lot of different areas. There are stores catering just to f bird feeding, mm -hmm. and those are a great source of information and good products. You can go to garden centers. They often have seeds and mm. feeders. Um, general department stores will often have seeds and feeders. As far as feed goes, um, keep it simple. Um, in a hopper feeder or the tubes that we showed you, just use sunflower seed by itself. Don't use a mix because a bird seed mix is like a bowl of nuts at a party. At the beginning of the evening, there's a nice variety. At the end of the night, people pick out all the cashews and you're left with pistachios and peanuts. <laughs> so um, if you have a mix in a feeder like that, the birds looking for sunflower are going to kick through, kick everything else out, you end up with a huge mess on the ground. Mm. So just feeding sunflowers and a hanging feeder like that. You have your Niger seed for the Niger feeder, which is just the goldfinches. Mm. And then you have in a tray, a platform feeder, you can put a mix if you want to there. Because mm -hmm. the, the ground feeding birds will eat the millet, which is that little round white seed you see in a lot of mixes. Yes. They will eat that, but they're not going to come to a feeder like that to get it. They want it on a flat tray. So on a tray, if you have a mix, the birds can pick out what they like without scattering everything. Mm. So uh, should we be cautious about pesticides, herbicides, you know, things like that? Short answer, yes. Um, poison is poison. Um, you can't mm. put out something toxic enough to kill one organism and think it's not going to affect a lot of other organisms. Oh. Um, so bird, think how small birds are, how small their kidneys and livers are to process any sort of toxic chemical can be uh, very uh, harmful. So when, an, when possible, just don't use any sort of chemical mm -hmm. fertilizers, pesticides. Try to use natural pest control whenever possible. Hand weeding, I know it's old fashioned, but it works. Um, using beneficial insects to kill garden pests. Oh, um, yes. Non-toxic um, pesticides are available, like insecticidal soap, things like that. We birders then, we're, we're building a positive ecology for the birds to come and hang out with us. We are. If it's a natural, diverse little ecosystem, the birds are going to use it. If it's too sterile, there's no reason for the birds to be there. I think your point is great. It is an ecosystem. We think of it as our backyard. Mm -hmm. It really is an ecosystem, isn't it? Okay, so the birds are coming. Yep. Uh, oh, you know what? I wanted to ask you, though, about the herbs and pesticides. Mm -hmm. that the thought popped into my mind about mm -hmm. cleaning, mm -hmm. whether we're cleaning the outside of our house where maybe we have a walkway and we have a bird feeder, mm -hmm. uh, or even cleaning these wonderful feeders. Mm -hmm. Is there a care in that, too? Do, do cleaners leave any residue that might be a problem? I use just a little dish soap. That's fine. Um, and rinse it well. Let it dry. And that's really all you need. In worst case scenarios, like if you're seeing sick birds or you have mm -hmm. a, a bad mold problem that got away from you, mm -hmm. um, a, a solution of 10% bleach to oh. kill the fungus. Wash your feeder really well with the bleach solution. Rinse it really well and let it dry completely. It's so powerful. No harm done. Bleach is strong, so you just it's very cut strong, it way yep. down and one then part to nine. Yeah, yeah. It's a 10% solution and um, let it dry well. Let it off gas and you're fine. Excellent. So now we have the bird uh, feeders up, and uh, I left the pile in the corner. Good. Uh, <laughs> give us some tips on identifying backyard birds in Portland. When you're learning to identify birds, a um, couple ways to go about it, and you should use all of them. Um, of course, you could get a field guide, a mm. book that tells you how to identify birds. Um, there are field guides for the whole country, but you might want to narrow it down to like birds of Oregon or birds, birds of the Willamette Valley. There's a wonderful little book called Birds of the Willamette Valley. It's very thorough, but it's just this mm. whole Vancouver to Eugene corridor. Mm. And um, so you don't have to worry about all the birds in Arizona. You can just concentrate on what you're likely to see, and it's much faster. Another way to go about learning your birds is to go out with other birders. That's the best way, really. Mm. Go on a bird walk. Um, local parks, local Audubon, they all sponsor bird walks where you just get together and someone leads you around and shows you birds. <laughs> I'll bet you know about it. Is it you go online and just search bird walk? You can do that. You can check with uh, the Audubon Society of Portland. Oh. They have a wonderful website. Mm -hmm. um, the Backyard Bird Shops here in Portland offer bird walks. Mm. Um, the park districts in the area also do such things. There's a Brewer's Blackbird. Mm. 
Yeah. Is that feed that's just on the ground? Yeah, there's some feed on the ground there. Some of it will spill out of the feeder, so you can actually feed on the ground um, as long as it's getting eaten up pretty well. There's the American goldfinch, the little yellow bird. Mm -hmm. There's some nice feeders there. You notice there's a shallow bird bath, which is just perfect. Yes, you mentioned that earlier, that we it's not about the just drinking water. They mm -hmm. like to bathe in them, too. Right. And um, I don't get Brewer's Blackbirds in my yard. They like a little more open habitat. You'll often see them in parking lots around Portland. But uh, they're a beautiful bird. They have a nice iridescent plumage, the males do, and those bright yellow eyes. Mm -hmm. And you notice on a platform feeder with the mix, they're picking through and finding what they like without scattering it everywhere. Mm. Now this looks like a, a plate that somebody has brought out just that day. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Again, the, the platforms, you don't store a lot of seed there. You just put out enough that they'll eat it in a day or two so it stays fresh. Yes. Careful about hygiene. Starting with birds that are most likely to come to sunflower feeders, either the tube feeder or the hopper feeder. This is a black-capped chickadee. It's a common little gray bird with a black cap and a black bib and a white cheek. They're very active, very vocal. They're fun to watch. Um, the, what they usually do is come to the feeder, grab a seed, and then fly to a shrub to eat it. They don't often hang out on the feeder itself. They're rather shy that way. There's another view of the black-capped chickadee. If you have lots of large Douglas firs or other conifers in your area, you might find chestnut back chickadees, very similar to the black capped chickadee with a little more brownish cast to the face and with a bright chestnut or rusty back and sides. Very rarely, like last winter, we had a little invasion of mountain chickadees. These birds are all gray with a little white eyebrow stripe. You don't expect them in the Portland area, but um, every so often in the winter, the sun will come down from the mountains. This is a house finch, one of the most common birds coming to a sunflower feeder. The male is basically a sparrow-sized bird with a reddish or orangish wash to the breast and above the eyes. This is a male purple finch. They're not as common as the house finches. Quite lovely, they have more of a raspberry purple color to them, covering um, pretty much the whole bird. You notice the very thick bill on these birds used for cracking open seeds. Here's a photo of a male house finch on top and a male purple finch down below to compare those two birds. These are pine siskins. They're very small, stripy finches. They're more common in winter. They tend to nest at higher elevations, but we do get a lot of them in the wintertime. They will come to sunflower feeders as well as niger feeders. But they're basically a small brown stripy finch with a little flash of yellow in the wings and a very fine pointed bill. Red-breasted nuthatches are common. Um, you often see them on tree trunks uh, looking for insects in the crevices of the bark, but they will come to seed feeders. You'll notice a very bold uh, black and white head pattern on this bird. Black-headed grosbeaks are here in the summer. They leave in the winter. But it's a very striking bird, fairly large compared to the finches, but a very heavy bill for cracking open seeds. Evening grosbeaks are a rare treat. They tend to stay up in higher elevations, but they do migrate through the Willamette Valley in spring and fall. Very, very large ivory-colored bills, bright yellow eyebrows, big white patches on the black wings. Scrub jays are common in town. You'll notice um, he's a little large for this feeder, but he still hangs on and gets his share of sunflower. There's another shot of the western scrub jay. The flicker is a species of woodpecker which gets most of his um, food from ants. He eats a lot of ants on the ground, but they will come to sunflower feeders. This is the female flicker. This is the male northern flicker with the red mustache. Very large bird compared to the finches anyway. Um, bright red under the wings and tail. Lots of speckles on the belly. 
And when you attract birds, sometimes you will attract animals that eat birds. This is a sharp-shinned hawk who's just captured a house finch. Some people get upset to see hawks at their feeder, but uh, other people just think it's another bird at the feeder. Everyone's got to eat. And that's it for the sunflower group. Okay. Moving on to the platform feeders. Platform feeders are very attractive to sparrows and other birds that like to feed on the ground. This is a song sparrow, a very common sparrow throughout the area, throughout the country actually. Dark-eyed juncos are a little more common in winter, but they can be found here all year. The adult junco has a dark hood and then a brown body, not a lot of streaking. In the wintertime, we can find fox sparrows. Fox sparrows kind of look like a song sparrow on steroids. They're bigger and bulkier, and the streaks on the breast consist of little chevrons. Spotted towhees are members of the sparrow family, but they're considerably larger than the other sparrows. They have long tails. They're usually found scratching on the ground, but they will come to a platform feeder. They like sunflower and millet. In the winter, we get golden crown sparrows. This bird is in breeding plumage. The head pattern is not quite as strong in the winter as it is in the summertime. This is a white crowned sparrow. They have a pattern on their head like a bicycle helmet with the bold stripes of black and white. And again, they're found in the winter and usually scratching around on the ground. Small numbers do nest in the Portland area. They're more often than not found in parking lots that have little shrubs. White-throated sparrows are becoming more common in the winter. Used to be hard to find one of these in Oregon, but now you can count on a few every winter. And they're similar to a white-crowned sparrow, but notice the bright white throat and the little patch of yellow above the eyes. Morning doves will come to platform feeders. This is a tube feeder with a big tray on the bottom, which serves as a platform. Eurasian collared doves have become more common in Portland over the past five years or so. They were introduced in North America in the 1960s, and they've made it all the way across the continent now. They're a little larger than a morning dove with that dark collar around the back. In the winter, we get varied thrushes, about the size of a robin, but with a pumpkin orange breast and a slate blue back. Um, they will come to platform feeders and eat millets. You'll also see them scratching around in the leaves for insects. <laughs> Moving on to Niger feeders. Niger feeders are popular with about three species of birds in the Portland area. Pine siskins, which are most common in the winter, Lesser goldfinches, like the bird, the yellow bird pictured here, and American goldfinches. Most other birds don't care for the Niger. You will see chickadees and juncos on it occasionally, but it's primarily just for the little yellow finches. This is an American goldfinch in non-breeding plumage. In the wintertime, they get a little duller. In summer, the males are bright yellow with black wings. Here's a comparison between a male lesser goldfinch on the left and a male American goldfinch on the right. The lesser goldfinch has an olive green back and a more extensive black cap, whereas the American goldfinch male is bright yellow all over with the black wings and a small black cap. There's the male lesser goldfinch. This is a female lesser goldfinch, very drab, more olive green, pale yellow underneath. This is a pine siskin. They're very fond of Niger. Again, a small, brown, stripy finch, a little bit of yellow in the wings, and a very fine bill. There's the back of the pine siskin. You can see just a hint of yellow in the wings there. This is a lesser goldfinch on the right and a female red-winged blackbird on the left. Rather surprised to see the red-winged blackbird eating the Niger seed, but she was doing just fine with it. And it's a nice comparison to see the size difference between these two birds.
You know, we had a question. Uh, I mentioned Ellie Serrero, our uh, fabulous photographer producer. Her husband sends an interesting question. Let me mm -hmm. read this. He says, in most large parks, there are either signs of, uh, you know, uh, there are either signs or staff telling people not to feed the animals. The usual reason given is the animals can become dependent on handouts. Uh, also, of course, uh, there are physical dangers, diseases, uh, improper foods. So uh, Gary's uh, question is, by feeding birds, can they uh, become too dangerously dependent? The difference between feeding birds in your yard and feeding animals in a park is that you're the only person in your yard. And parks have thousands upon thousands of people coming through. Oh, of course. So there's a, a, a difference of economics, if you will. Yeah, the scale is. Yes. And again, as long as you remember that you're feeding birds for your enjoyment um, and do it responsibly, um, you're not going to create too much of a dependency. I've read studies that show that uh, an individual bird is going to get maybe 10% of his daily food from one feeder. And mm. he, uh, then he has other sources. He's got other feeders. He's got natural foods around his little root that he does. Mm. So um, as long as you're feeding responsibly, you're keeping your feeding area clean, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to worry about harming the birds. We're a kind of a rest stop for that bird exactly. who's got a long day. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for bringing these in. Uh, John Rakestraw, extraordinary uh, bird expert, and today has truly helped me realize that the reason we do this is so we can enjoy this. Invite nature into your home, please, or just outside of it. And, <laughs> uh, you know, get over the whole thing about habitat and activism or whatever your your idea is please invite nature uh, close to your home be careful with nature uh, treat it hygienically and uh, nutritionally and i can't wait <laughs> i can't wait to get started in my yard <laughs>